Are you ready for some color work? Let's do this. Show me love. Show me love. Hello, my friends, and welcome back to the Marley Bird YouTube channel. I'm Marley Bird, your bi crafty bestie. This is video two of the Kaleidoscope Poncho Knit Along. This knit along is sponsored by Yarn Spirations, and for four weeks, we get to make this beautiful poncho. In the last video, we completed the collar, the shaping of the neck, and we worked our increases to get us started on the yoke of the poncho. So by this point, you should have all of video one complete, ready to dive in with video two. And I'm telling you, this video, you guys, it is chock full of instruction, of tips, of tricks, of all the, all the good things, all the good things that pertain to color work. So this is what you need to do. As always, this is a free pattern. You will find a link in the video description box right down there below. Click on that and you will get the instructions for this video. Once you have those instructions with you, I want you to grab your homework and I want you to get all nine colors, all of the nine colors you plan on using for your poncho. Join me back here and we will get started reading those charts. All right, guys, I'm so excited. Let's do this. Oh, I just, I love color work. Okay, this right here, everybody, this is your chart number one. You will have eight total charts for this poncho and each one has a different stitch multiple because we will be working increases between each one of these charts. Now, charts are not difficult to read and I'm going to walk you through everything you need to know to read the charts for this poncho. I'm also going to include a lot of extra instruction that you will be able to use for future projects. So if you wanted to take notes as I'm talking through this video or bookmark this video, add it to a playlist, it might be a really good idea because there is a lot of information that's going to be flowing here. All right. So first things first, when you look at a chart like this, for mine, I have all of the numbers written on here. If yours doesn't have numbers, go ahead and add them on there. It will help you. You want to read the chart from right to left. Okay, we're going to read our charts from right to left. And each of the rows of the chart represent one round of your knitting. Okay, each one of the squares on your chart chart represent one stitch on your knitting. So if you're looking right here, this is round one, stitch one, round one, stitch two, round one, stitch three. And you will notice that each one of these as you go along could be a different color. All right. So as we are working around row number one, we will make the first stitch this color, the second stitch this color, the third stitch this color, the fourth stitch this color, the fifth stitch this color. And we will do that by working what's called stranded color work. Now, if each one of these squares represents a stitch and each one has its own color, that means you will change the color as you work along the round. Now, one thing I want you to note here, and this is a big tip, okay, this is one that you can use throughout the entire poncho, is this 10 stitch repeat is what you will work all the way around the poncho. So if you're somebody who wants to make sure that you are always keeping those 10 stitches the same, I highly recommend grabbing like a stitch marker and putting like a stitch marker between each of your 10 repeats. If you do that, not only is that going to help you just keep track of, okay, those 10 stitches need to be just like that. But if you happen to accidentally make a mistake within these 10 stitches, you will quickly be able to find it. Because as you're going from this stitch marker across the road to this one, if all of a sudden you only can do one of the oranges down here instead of two, you know that somewhere along this row, you messed up. 
By doing this, you guys, that means you don't have to wait until you get to all the way at the end of the round to find out that there's a mistake somewhere like halfway back. By putting those stitch markers in place, you can quickly identify a mistake and fix it immediately. So I highly recommend those stitch markers between those 10 stitch repeats. And if you're new to color work, I absolutely recommend this. If you've done color work and you're familiar with this, you could skip this step. It's totally up to you. But I will be honest, even I will make little simple mistakes where instead of putting three stitches of one color, maybe I just do two. And then I get to the very end and I have to go back and it's just annoying. So if you have the stitch markers, why not use them? Okay, why not use them? Now, talking about stitch markers, I'm going to move those away so that way we aren't distracted. But now we're going to talk about something very, very important because obviously we're doing color work here. And when I did the color work for this uh, stitch, I knew I wanted to change colors every row to get a different look, but I also wanted to keep this arrow going on here in the orange. You guys see that? So that means as we go from round one to round two to round three to round four, there's always going to be a color change. So as we finish round one and go to round two, we will no longer use our pink here. We would chance transfer over and we would use our sprout color right here. All right. When we make this change, we are going to cut our old color and rejoin with our new color. Now, this is important. This is important. Listen up. Come up close. Okay, come up close. We will be doing a lot of color changes, which means we will have a lot of tails to weave in. Okay, listen. <laughs> don't, don't let that discourage you. Listen, listen, listen to me here. These tails are nothing to be scared about, and weaving in your ends is nothing you should be frightened of because those tails give you an opportunity to close any holes you might have at the start of your round. It makes a nice, tidy finish of your project. And conversely, if you were to pull up your yarn from one row to the next, for example, like if we left our darker green color here on round three and we dropped it for round four so we could use the blue and then we picked it up again right here for round five to use the green. Yeah, the float from here to here is just one it's just going over top one round. But what tends to happen is as you're pulling the yarn, because the color would actually be over here, as you're pulling this yarn here up and over here to use it, it puts extra tension on this stitch and it tends to create a hole. So the very thing you don't want in your knitting, you inadvertently are creating because you're trying to make it easy so you don't have tails. Listen, tails are, are just the nature of the game when it comes to color work, okay? And we can use our tail to do duplicate stitch to close holes. We could bury our ends of the tail with this wool yarn. That's a great option. There's a lot of things to do. So this is my heads up, you guys. You are going to have tails. You are going to have to weave in your ends and you're just gonna have to deal with it because if you want your work to look as professional and as wonderful as possible, it's what we have to do. And with all of these color changes, it should be expected. And I'm telling you, it's it's just not that hard. So there's going to be tails because every time there's a color change, you will cut your old color and join your new color. Okay, let's repeat after me. Every time there is a color change, you will cut your old color that you're not going to use anymore and you will add your new color that you're using every single time, okay? Every single time. Don't skimp on this. Just, just trust me on this, guys. Trust the process. <laughs> All right, now that I've scared you thoroughly. So as I mentioned, there is going to be a color change every single round here for the alternate color, essentially. But the orange, your the orange color is going to be maintained throughout this whole piece. So I absolutely loved the way this stitch pattern looked because it allowed me to use one, two, three, four, 
five different colors all in this one stitch pattern. And it just looks really cool. So this is how we're going to tackle this. We're going to read from right to left, and then you jump up one row and right to left, jump up one row, right to left. Now, here's the big tip I'm going to show you. And this is something that a lot of people do. You'll notice that it's, it's pretty, it's pretty standard. Okay. As you're working on your color work, if you've never done color work before, this might be new to you, obviously. You want to cover the stitches that you have not worked yet. You do not want to cover the stitches that you've worked. As you're looking at your chart, cover the stitches you have not worked. So we're covering all of uh, rows two through seven. We work through this full repeat, right? All the way around. And then we get to round two. So you're gonna move your piece of paper or your post-it note up. And then you're gonna read round two just like this, okay? And then when it gets to round three, you're gonna read round three, you move your piece of paper up and you read it just like this. This is important to tell you because it helps you keep track of where you are as you're working with your chart. If you were to cover up the stitches you've created, you then don't have a guide of what color the stitch is on your needle as you're working your next round of stitches. So for example, after you complete round one, we know that our first five stitches here are pink, 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 purple, or pink, 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 orange, orange, right? But when we go to round two, we can quickly see here that we have an orange working on our pink, the sprout working on our pink, the sprout working on our pink, the sprout working on our orange, and the orange working on top of our orange. So as you're working along your row, you quickly have a way to double check that you're on the right part of the stitch pattern. Because if all of a sudden you're putting this orange and it's over top of another orange and you have two oranges in a row, you know something is off, right? So this is your second like fail safe, right? So the first one, you have your stitch markers in between your 10 stitches to help you make sure, oh, I got to the end of the row, if it, if it, or the end of my repeat here, something was off. So you get to check these 10 stitches to make sure something's right, right? The next one is that as we move up and your stitch markers move up, right? The second fail safe here is that you're going to double check that each stitch you're creating is going into the correct color stitch underneath it. Okay, so that's the second way you're going to make sure that everything is on par as you're working your project. And you would just keep moving up your chart or moving up your piece of paper on your chart as you get along until you get all the way to round seven. Okay, does that make sense? Is that good? So as far as charts go, this is your chart number one. Let's take a peek real quick. This is your chart number two. You can see this chart only has four rounds and it also has 12 stitches for the repeat. So the second chart has two stitches more than the first chart. That is by design, you guys, because as you look at your body, obviously it's a more narrow circumference up here versus as you get down to like by your elbows, right? As everything's in it and you have your poncho. So we have to increase our yoke to make sure it fits all the way around, around our chest, around our shoulders and all the way down our arms. So as we transfer through this whole pattern, as we go from one chart to the next, Next, there is an increase round between one chart to the next. That increase round will always be done with your main color and it will always make it to where the stitch repeat increases by two. So the first chart, as we said, the first chart has 10 stitches. The second chart has 12 stitches. Your third chart has 14 stitches, and you could probably already guess how many the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth chart will be, right? Can you see that? All right, you guys see how that works up? Now, something else I wanna point out here as we're talking about charts, because it actually might be something that you have come across, whether you are familiar with color work or you've been 
trying to dabble in it, or maybe you're somebody who's is completely new and you've been reading up on it, you might have heard about weaving or tucking in your floats. Now, for this stranded color work, there is only um, one, maybe two sections where you will actually have to weave or tuck in your floats, and that's by design. I purposely made it so that way several of the charts never have stitches that are further apart than five stitches. So that way, even a beginner could approach this project, begin to get comfortable with stranded color work before they have to introduce, you know, a whole new sort of technique to the whole process. And the reason here is because typically you never want to have a float from one stitch to the next cross over more than five stitches. So by design, you guys, I thought through this as I was de designing this, I never made it to where we go from, you know, even just, let's just go right here from the pink, this pink to where we come over and use the pink here, it would, the float would go behind these orange ones and it's just two stitches, right? Even here, the orange has to go behind the sprout before we use it again, and it's just three stitches. Same thing as you look at the future ones, there's four stitches that you would have to cross here. And then as you look at this one, again, it's just four stitches, all right? So for this part of the knit along, you will not be doing any sort of weaving or tucking in your floats. We're simply going to manage our stranded knitting as you normally would manage your stranded knitting. Does that make sense? All right, so that is a great segue to we're going to transfer over to the actual stranded knitting. I'm going to show you how to do this. So let's go ahead, get all of your yarn colors, you guys. Grab your homework, buckle in, because um, here we go. Be ready to be amazed by the float porn, everybody. <laughs> That's right. It's a real thing. Uh, what I mean by that is the beauty of the inside of your stranded color work when you do it appropriately. So let's take a peek. Welcome to float porn, everybody. Here it is. This is the inside of a hat I made using the remaining yarn from the poncho because you will have yarn left over. The amounts of each color will depend on the size you're making, but um, you can make other projects. Um, I actually have more yarn. I can make another hat, but here's what we're going to pay attention to. First off, look how beautiful the inside of this hat is, right? All of the color changes, everything just looks really amazing. But here's what we want to pay attention to. And this is important as we go into our stranded knitting. Right down here, can you see how this teal color right here, see that teal color? And then see the rich raspberry color right here. This teal is never twisted around that rich raspberry, right? It's never twisted around. Those two yarns never twist around each other. But you will notice the teal is always above or in, uh, and on top of the red raspberry. See how the teal's up here, red raspberry, teal, red raspberry, teal, red raspberry, teal, red raspberry, okay? That is by design, you guys. Same thing as you come down here and look, here's the teal and then the cream color, teal and cream, teal and cream, teal and cream, teal and cream. As we go on, we have the teal, teal and blue, teal and blue, teal and blue, right? Can you guys see how that goes? That is very important because the placement of the color on top is done by putting the yarn in your right hand when you knit with it. The placement of the yarn on the bottom is by placing that yarn in your left hand as you knit with it, okay? So this is a, this is a place you want to take notes, okay? So here we go. We're talking about color dominance here, okay? All that means is when you're working with two colors and you have one color in each hand, the color that is in your left hand will pop ever so slightly more on the right side of your fabric than the color that's in your right hand, okay? So that means the color that you will hold in your left hand will be your dominant color, your color dominance versus the color in your right hand, okay? Another way to think of this is the color that is in your left hand or the color that is on the bottom of the two colors along the row 
or the round, right? The color that's on the bottom is going to show up a little bit more, going to be your dominant color, more so than the color that's on the top, okay? The color on top is not your dominant color. The color on bottom is your dominant color. Same thing, color on top is the color in your right hand, color on bottom is the color in your left hand. Can you see how that works? Now that's important because if you are somebody who decides to do color work where you only want your color in one hand, maybe you, you drop a color each time to pick up when you wanna use it, which is totally fine. It's gonna take you a little bit more time, but you can absolutely do it. It's gonna be so important for you to remember that whatever color you always want on top, you, you put that color like towards the right, right? You're gonna, as you drop the color, you're gonna hold it to the right. And the color you want on the bottom, as you drop that color, you're gonna hold it to the left. So that way you never cross the yarn, right? Never cross streams, don't, don't break the stream, don't do that, okay? Any, any Ghostbusters fans out here? So as we are working on our stranded color work, your color work will look beautiful just like this and you'll never have yarn twisted around each other. And as you're talking about um, yarn management and stuff, it's never going to be twisted around each other either. It's always going to be nice and smooth. Okay, you guys see that? Another thing we're going to talk about as we're doing this, notice my floats are nice and spaced out from one stitch to the next so that they never bunch up my stitches. My stitches are never puck puckered up, right? Everything's nice and smooth. And it really just looks like one stitch goes to the next and, and the yarn that floats behind them is the same distance as what the width would be of those stitches. Okay. So that's going to be really important. You want to make sure that your floats are all really nice and consistent and none of them ever bunch up. But isn't that pretty? So that's that's what float porn is, everybody. It's almost as if the wrong side of the work is just as beautiful as the right side of the work. Right? Look at that. And yes, I wove in all my ends. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you. I wove them all in. You can see they're all right there. A lot of time. Every single, every single round on this, there was a color change. But I wove in all my ends. It's, it's good to go. But look at that. It's beautiful. All right. It's so great. I love it so much. Okay. Now that we've talked about float porn and the importance of color dominance, remember the color in your right hand is on top. It's less dominant than the color in your left hand, which will be on the bottom and it's your dominant. All right. So that's important. Now let's go ahead. We're going to grab your homework and we are going to work through a round of knitting so that way I can show you how to hold your yarn with the two colors, whether you're dropping a color and picking it up or you're holding it in two hands. So get your yarn. Let's go, guys. Let's go. Okay, back to chart number one. Let's talk about this. Like I said, we have three stitches with our pink two stitches with your orange or whatever color you plan on using. So one thing you could do, you guys, is you could take your yarn and on your label, you could use a magic marker to list this as your color A or your color B or your color C or so on and so forth. So that way you remember what color you used when, like if that's something you want to do, you absolutely could do that. Okay. So here is my homework and you can see I've actually already completed the chart number one. Now mine looks a little different than yours because I changed the number of colors uh, because I'm making a second sample. I want it to look just a little bit different, but the process is going to be the same here. So I'm going to use this chart to show you how to do the two color to get started. And then I'm going to jump to chart number two. So here's the deal. First things first, right now you have your main color attached. Go ahead, cut your main color, leave yourself at least six inches of tail. I actually like to leave a little bit longer than that. It's easier to weave in your tails if they're longer. So leave yourself a nice long tail. Remember, we're gonna weave in tails. Once you do that, grab the two colors you are going to use for this portion, okay? So I have my teal here and I have my sea foam. Let me grab my sea foam. I just had, I just had the tail. I just had it, here it is. Oh gosh, I hate it when that happens. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. You guys ready? We have the first three stitches are going to be 
with our pink. For me, that's going to be teal. The next two stitches are going to be with your orange. For me, that's going to be seafoam. Okay, so I will go into that first stitch. I will grab my teal. Again, I want to leave a nice long tail. Okay, I want to leave a nice long tail. And I'm going to take my yarn, wrap it around my right hand needle, and pull that through. I will knit the next stitch, making sure I'm not using the tail. I knit the next stitch, and then I knit the third stitch. Okay. The next two stitches are seafoam. So I'm going to drop my teal, and as I do it, I'm going to put it over here towards the right side. I'm showing you how to do this with just one hand at this time. Go into my stitch, grab my seafoam, again, leave a nice long tail, wrap it around, and knit. Do one more. Make sure you are not using your tail. Do not use your tail. Wrap it around and out. Now I have to go back to the teal. And remember, I do not want to cross my tails. So I'm going to take my, my seafoam, my orange essentially, put it over here towards the left. And I come back over here. I pick up my teal, right? I pick up my teal and I float it behind those two stitches I just created. So as I knit this next stitch, and I float it behind to knit and off that float right there, that float right there, can you see it? That float is no shorter or pinching together those two blues, okay? I'm making sure it's the good width. Once you do that, you're gonna go ahead and carry on. So I go to the next one, because remember we have three of these. Now I would drop my teal. I always put it over here towards the right. It's again, for making sure that that will always be on top, it just makes it easier. I pick up the color I wanna use now, and again, I make sure this color here, as it floats across those three stitches, I wanna make sure it doesn't pucker or bunch. So I float it across, wrap my yarn around my needle, and knit. And then do one more. Make sure everything's good. Drop this, move it over to the left, okay? That's 10 stitches. So if I wanted to use a marker at this point, so that way I can identify the 10 stitch repeat, I can put a marker on and I can continue on, okay? You guys see how that works? Now I'm gonna just pop that in there so I can float this over. Let's take a peek at what we have. You can see here's the two working yarns that we're working with. Here's my two tails that I will weave in later. And what will be great is I can use this tail and as I weave it in this direction, see how it's gonna, right now there's a gap there. As I weave this tail into this direction and then I'm gonna weave my gray tail into that direction, it will close that gap. Okay, I hope you guys can see that. But these tails will be used to close any gaps. So those are gonna go away. But what I want you to notice the most here Notice this float here is on top of this one. If you looked at it here, see the teal is on top of the seafoam. Can you guys see that? The teal is on top of the seafoam, right? So I kept that teal towards the right. I kept it in my right hand. The seafoam, I kept it to the left. I kept it, you know, if you think about it in your left hand. So that is important. We're going to maintain that all the way through, okay? Now, that's how you will do it if you are dropping the color each time. So that way you don't twist your colors. Now, let's talk about my favorite way to do stranded color work. And I want to encourage a lot of you. I know that this might seem something that you're like, gosh, I, I'm not very good at knitting with my left hand or I'm not very good at knitting with my right hand. I want you to give it a try. I mean, there's no better time to give it a try than on a project like this where you're literally, the whole thing is color work. And I am going to tell you my little tip that I have to make sure that you maintain consistent stitches all the way through, whether you are knitting with your left or your right or knitting with them together, okay? So um, let's do this. Here we go, this is my favorite. Now remember, my teal, I wanted it on my right, so I'm gonna hold that in my right hand, okay? My seafoam, I wanted that in my left, 
So I'm going to hold that into my left hand. Okay, so here I am. You guys see that? I moved the charts so that way it wasn't uh, distracting underneath. Now I want to do three stitches with my teal. So I go in, I knit one, two, three. The whole time I'm just holding my, my seafoam color. Now I want you to notice what I just did. I spaced out my stitches so that way they are distanced apart on my needle, the same distance they would be like in the fabric, okay? I don't want them bunched up like this. If they're bunched up like this and I bring my float across, they're gonna be bunched up forever because your float does not stretch. That is that is a notable thing to write down if you are not familiar with this. The float, this the yarn that goes behind your stitches it will not stretch. So don't think to yourself, oh, that puckering will even out later on when I block. It won't. Like you do not want to get a pucker in your stitches. And this is how you prevent that, you guys. Do not have your stitches all bunched up on your right hand needle. Make sure they are spaced out just as they would be in your fabric, okay? When you do that, that makes it so as your float, that blue there, goes behind those three teal stitches, it's going to be the correct length to give those three teal stitches room to breathe, okay? And so what I just did there is I just went in and I knit with my blue, all right? Now I'm gonna show you again, and this one, we're gonna do it the same way, and you're gonna notice that it puts the teal on top, right? And the blue on the bottom, or the seafoam. So I go in, my stitches are spaced out. Try that again. In, yarn over, off. The second one, the third one. Make sure everything's spaced out nice. And then I do two with the seafoam. You guys see that? And then I would grab another marker if that's what you're doing. And I could put that there, okay? It's really one of those things that just having this little bit of practice, I mean, this is a really easy stitch pattern to practice this. It will help you. Now, regarding practice, I know that when I first taught myself how to throw, because I am um, a continental knitter, that's, that's what I'm used to. I was a crocheter before I knit. So I am used to knitting with my left hand. It actually was very difficult for me to knit with my right hand. And there are a couple things that I noticed that, I did when I first started throwing, or I noticed when I was teaching others to first do continental, um, that made their stitches so tight and inconsistent. And it's just this one little tweak, this one little tweak will make it so that your stitches are consistent with both ways. And so this is what you're going to practice as you're working with the yarn in both hands. All right, so here we go. So what we wanna do is grab the teal and we're gonna hold it in my right hand and grab the sea foam, and I will hold it in my left hand. Now, this is important. Do you notice that I have my fingers holding the yarn? They're like behind my needles. They're not up here on top of my needles. They're like behind my needles, right? I wanna make sure that as I'm completing these stitches that this is like my resting point. This is where I want my yarn and my fingers to come back to every time. And here's what I mean. So I've got to do three stitches with my teal. So I go into the teal, make sure my stitches are nice and spaced out right so that my float doesn't pinch. Two and three. Notice my finger always comes back here to my resting point. Here's why. A lot of new throwers will come and they will bring the yarn and come like this to tighten that stitch. Notice that that makes this portion of your stitch really, really small. It's not a, the full circumference of your needle anymore. And it pulls up that, the, what would, is gray here for me, the row below, it pulls that bump up. So when you pull this up like this, you get a really short stitch. Whereas if you bring your yarn back to where it's supposed to be, to your resting point, notice the stitch now is the full circumference of your needle and you don't have the stitch beneath it getting pulled up. Let's do that again. 
this time we're gonna do it with our left hand. So I spaced out my yarn so that way I don't have a float that is going to pinch. I knit, right, I'm into the stitch, I knit, and I go back to my resting point and off. Because when I do that, you see how the stitch is now all the full circ circumference of my needle? Whereas if I pull it up, if I knit and I pull it up, it pulls up the row below, it makes the stitch really short, and it just looks ugly. So as you are working, whether it's with your yarn in your left hand or the yarn in your right hand, as long as you always bring your finger with the yarn to the back, sort of like your resting point, you will have really nice, beautiful stitches. And this is just one of those things, just take your time with it, okay? Again, if you were putting a stitch marker, this is where you'd add a stitch marker, and you would carry on. You guys see that? See how beautiful those stitches are? They're all nice and spaced apart. You can see on the opposite side, as we take a peek here, all of my, all of the, the row below, none of them are like pinching up on anything. All of the stitches are nice and uniform. And then furthermore, we can take a peek at all of my floats. None of them are pinching together any two stitches. The floats are nice and relaxed going across the back of the stitches that are used. And my teal is on top of my seafoam, teal on top of my seafoam, teal on top of my seafoam, okay? Now, um, I understand that it might sound like I'm like, always put the teal on top. That's not that's not true. It just so happens that I did that for this one. If I wanted the sea foam on top, I totally could have done that. So at the end of the day, the choice is yours, which yarn you want to have on top and which yarn you want to have on the bottom. Or think of it as which yarn you want to have non-dominant versus dominant. And so for me, I kind of look at what the stitch pattern is and I'm like, do I want my orange, like for example, let's take a peek at this real quick. Do I want my orange arrows to really look like they're popping up and have it be a little bit more dominant? If the, if the answer is yes, then I'd make sure that the orange was in my left hand, right? I'd make sure it was in my left hand and I'd put all of these other colors in my right hand. Or maybe you want the opposite. Maybe you want all of these colors to really pop up and the orange to kind of like be this sort of background so then in that case, you'd put the orange in your right hand. Guys, and this is this is like one of those things, it's really subtle, I think, when it comes to this particular poncho, but as you move forward to future projects, color dominance could be a very, very important factor in your stitch patterns, because if you're working on an all over stitch pattern where it's all the same pattern over and over and over and over, and one section you have color A in your left hand, and then you decide to put it in color Color, color A in your right hand for the next section, it, it will be noticeable. Um, again, this is just one of those, those little small things that's gonna take your knitting to that next level just because you're aware now that there is such a thing as color dominance with stranded knitting done in this way where you have the floats floating behind and you never cross over those stitches, okay? Like there's a huge, we could dive in so much more with all of this, but there's there's just no need. Okay, uh, because what you need to know, I just taught you. <laughs> so the next step, I want you to finish this round, finish round one, and then join me back here for round two. I'm gonna walk you through how to cut the color you're not going to use, rejoin the color, and then we're going to put into practice the reading of the stitches on your needle and the color you're using to kind of keep that, remember I told you it was, it was like your double check, it was like a chance for you to check and make sure you're in the right place again. So we're gonna do that, all right? So go ahead, put hit pause, don't, don't turn me off, just hit pause, finish round one, join me back here for round two. Hopefully that wasn't too difficult. Show of hands, how many of you used one hand and how many of you used two hands to do the stranded color work? Hopefully many of you used the two hands and gave that a try. Let's go ahead and move on to round two. 
at this point, this is what you've completed, correct? So as we move our piece of paper up and we look at round two, we can see here that we will continue on working with what would be your orange color, but we will drop our red raspberry and pick up sprout. So it's not just dropping, we're gonna cut that yarn, leaving at least six inches, and then we're gonna pick up the sprout and continue on. Now, as we do that, we will be able to double check our stitches by making sure that you're putting your orange on top of a pink, a sprout on top of a pink, a sprout on top of a pink, a sprout on top of an orange, an orange and on top of an orange or whatever colors you're using, right? Now that's gonna be true throughout. So here's what I'm gonna do. Even though I know you're on row two of chart number one, I am actually on row four of chart number two. And so I'm going to skip ahead to this just so you can see how this works up. Now, if I wanted to have my piece of paper here, this is where it would be. I don't I don't need it because I'm at the, the top of my chart. And I am on chart number two. I have worked up all the way through three rows, right? I'm getting ready to start this row. So for me, I am going to put sprout right on top of seafoam, sprout on top of teal, sprout on top of teal, sprout on top of seafoam, teal on top of teal, teal on top of teal. Can you see how that works? Now my colors are slightly different than what are on here. Instead of sprout, I actually am using seafoam and I'm still using teal. So I'm gonna use seafoam and um, teal. And then instead of seafoam down here, I'm using my dark charcoal gray color, just because I changed colors, just like yours could be a different color, but it's the same process. Okay. So I'm at the end of my row. I am going to continue on with my teal. So I am not cutting my teal because I have my teal still getting used right there. Right. But I'm no longer going to use my dark gray. So I'm going to cut a nice long tail of my dark gray set that aside. Now here's a little tip. Say that you've put down your work and you haven't picked it up. Maybe it's, you know, the next day and you're trying to remember which color you had in your right hand and which color you have in your left hand. This is how you're going to figure that out. Pick up your work and just kind of flip it over just like so and look at which color is on top right of the previous two colors you used and for this one the gray is on top so i know that that was in my right hand which means my teal is in my left hand so when i join my new color because i cut my gray remember i cut my gray when i join my new color i will also hold that new color in my right hand i want to continue keeping my teal in my left hand okay so i'm gonna I'm gonna move this out of the way. This is chart number two if you wanna look along with me, but I know I'm gonna do four stitches with my new color. So let me grab my new color, which is right here. I'm gonna leave a tail, you know, I'm gonna leave a tail. So I'm gonna stitch right here into my first stitch. Ooh, make it into there with my new color. I'm just, I'm literally just wrapping it around my needle and I will continue on. Make sure you don't knit with your tail. We do not want to knit with our tail, right? If I can get this here, all situated. Two, for me it's one, two, three, and then four. And then this is gonna be an opportunity for you to see here because the four stitches that we're working across Again, I want to make sure, because this, this teal here is coming from this stitch all the way over here, over here to this one. So I want to make sure that the float is the right distance over those. Make sure it's not too tight so everything is nice and spaced out. So one and two. One, two, three, four again remember I'm holding my yarn to the back and one and two now here's the cool part on on this particular chart when you get to chart number two you're gonna notice that <clears throat> you are stacking all of your teals right in in different sections so it's a stack of three rows of teal right here but then there's um, just the blue down here and then there's two rows of teal 
and we're going to create the third row here. So it's kind of neat to kind of watch this happen. So for example, here's my teal. I'm sorry, not my teal, my, my blue. These three rows of teals are already complete. So I can look at my work and I know that it's going to be my sea foam on top of that one and a sea foam on top of this one and a sea foam on top of that one right to my four and then here are two teal with one two rows so I'm gonna complete my third row right there and just carry on okay now I am not using stitch markers in here I didn't want to put them in and confuse you by having 12 stitches but essentially I could put my markers in here too and keep track of my 12 stitches so my first stitch marker would actually go right there and I could see that I have my 12 stitches going along can you see how that works? Can you see how looking at the color of the stitches beneath, um, like, so let's say it this way, the color of the stitches on my left hand needle are a direct representation of the color of the stitches from row three. So as I'm working row four, I can see what color I'm working into, okay? All right, so now that you know how to work that second round, I want you to go ahead and finish your chart number one. Finish chart number one, meet me back here, and we're gonna move on to the increase round, which is completely different than the way we did increases for the, the neck shaping. So finish it up, hit pause, and I'll see you when you're all done. Hopefully by now you're starting to get really excited about the next step because you're starting to see how your colors are melding together. Take a quick snapshot of your work right now. As a matter of fact, take a snapshot of your work after you complete each chart. It's so much fun to see the progress pictures and you won't regret it. Okay, let's take a look at mine. And as you already know, I was working on my chart number two. So here's my chart number two next to my chart number one. I think it looks pretty darn amazing. I love all the colors I have going on here. And I'm ready to do my increase round. Now this increase round is necessary. So that way I get the correct number of stitches for my chart number three. And as I mentioned, I think at the start of this video, all of your increases are going to be worked with your main color, okay? So so the main color that you started off with, that's what we need to add on here. So I'm going to go ahead and cut all of the yarn that I was using. So I'm going to leave a nice long tail and those tails, I'm going to weave those in once I'm done with this chart and I'm going to grab my main color. And what I want to do here is I am going to work increases around with my main color and I will work the increases as written using the knit front and back. So for you, you have just completed your chart number one. So you're doing your first set of increases right here. So all that means is you will be doing a knit one, a knit front and back, and then knit three. So you're gonna use up five stitches, but when everything is said and done, you will have six stitches, okay? So it'll be knit one, knit front and back, knit three. Knit one, knit front and back, knit three. That's 10 stitches. You will have increased two stitches, giving you 12 stitches between your markers if you have markers in place. Does that make sense? On the next set of increases, you'll end up doing a knit two, a knit front and back, a knit three. See how that's six stitches? A knit two, a knit front and back, a knit three. So that'll give you your 12, plus you'll have then two extra stitches. So that'll give you your 14, right? I guess that doesn't look like 14, it'll 14. <laughs> All these numbers, 14, uh, when you begin your third chart, okay? So this is how these increases are gonna be worked. So what I wanna do here is I wanna show you how you do a knit front and back, okay? So let's see here. Oh, I'm only using one color, duh. I just wanna make sure I have everything. I just am gonna hold my tails here just to make sure that all the, everything just feels like it's in place. So I've knit one stitch and for you, this is where you would do a knit front and back. So you're gonna go into the stitch, yarn over your needle, come out the stitch, go around the stitch, go into the back leg, yarn over your needle and off. You're gonna see that's going to leave a nice little pearl bump 
right there on your increase, that is by design, you guys. That's why I chose to use the knit front and back instead of the make one, is I wanted that little blip of texture. You can see here, after yours, uh, you'll have these little blits of texture. See where I have the little blip of the sprout color there? Those were my, my knit front and backs. I love the way they look, so that's why I chose to use the knit front and back, okay? So it'll be knit one, knit front and back, and then you'll do a knit three. So one, two, three. And it's just with one color. So you will knit one, knit to the front of a stitch, knit into the back of that same stitch, and off. Can you see that? Okay, that's a knit front and back. Now, as you're working around all of these increases, at some point, the number of stitches that are on your needles might get too crowded, and you might want to change to a longer set of needles. I will tell you that the best time to change to a longer set of needles is on the increase round, because you're just working those increases, and you're also only using one color. So it just makes it easier to transfer over to those longer needles when you're on an increase round. So whenever Whenever it's time to transfer to your longer needles, choose the increase round to do that. And don't forget, after you finish each of the sections, take a second and weave in your ends. I'm going to show you how to do that right now so that way you don't have any excuse not to do this. So let's take a peek right down here. Okay, for this part, we can use a very sharp chenille needle or a bent tip tapestry needle. This one is used more for like duplicate stitch. This one is used for burying your ends. I like to actually kind of combine the two together when I'm working on a project in the round like this. I will do the duplicate stitch to close up the the seam essentially where the join is and then I will bury everything in with my chenille needle. So let's go ahead. I've already tucked in many of my ends on my project but you can see here I'm at the start of the row this was the last that was the the last row of my chart number two both of these colors were and I would want to weave in this green one moving in this direction and this teal one going in that direction and what that will do is you see that there's a gap right there it's gonna close up that gap so that's where I would use my tapestry needle to really do duplicate stitch um, and then I would weave in my tail through all of the fibers of the floats, and that's where I would bury my ends. So I'm gonna start down here. So this gray one right here, this one is one that was cut off down there quite, oh no. Hopefully that makes a lot of sense, using your tails to really seam together one join from the next. Let's go ahead and uh, see it in action. All right, so I'm gonna do my best to do this to where you all can see. I'm going to use the light seafoam color first because I think that that'll be the easiest to see. But I'm gonna show you what I do here. So I'm gonna bring this up here. This seafoam color, it was last used right here. So, and I have this one right here. So this one, I'm gonna go in this direction. This one, I'm gonna go in this direction. So I'm just gonna kind of pull those up. Let's see, I can see here that this seafoam color, it would come up and it would actually come into that stitch up here. So I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna go underneath actually. Let's see here. I'm gonna move the green out of the way so I can see. Let's do this, I'm gonna come up this green, can you see where this tail here comes up and inside there and then back down? We're gonna follow that path. So I'm holding this over here, so that's where that would be. And I'm going to follow this path of the stitch on the wrong side, just to get it started and it will close up this little gap right there. Okay, now I could continue on in doing duplicate stitch and that would be perfectly fine as far as weaving in 
a tail, okay? And none of these duplicate stitches are showing on the opposite side. I don't know if you can see that. Like all of the, the teal is there. So because I'm doing the duplicate stitch on the wrong side, it's not showing up on the right side. But what I like to do is once I get a couple of the duplicate stitch in where I wanna go, I then bury my end. So you can bury your end with a tapestry needle. It's just a little bit more difficult than a chenille, and I'll show you here in a second, uh, the chenille way. But with this one, I'm going to literally, I'm gonna move that gray. I'm going to just pierce through the fibers of some of these floats. And by doing that, I'm just going to pull this yarn through some of these fibers of the float. See how I'm just like through the fibers, I'm actually splitting them. And I pull it through just like this, okay? Now as I work my way back, this is where the chenille needle comes in handy, I'm actually going to not only work into the fiber of these stitches, but I'm gonna work through the fiber of the tail I just pulled through. So I pull through the fiber of the tail also. And what that will do is it links and makes all of these wool fibers all kind of trap inside each other. And so over time, this sort of felts together and it really secures your end, okay? So there's, there's that one, it's all secured in, everything looks great. Now, if I were using a chenille needle, that's the one where it's, it's super duper pointy. The hard part here is that the eye of the needle is really kind of hard to get into. So what I will do is I will fray the end of my yarn just a little bit so that they're separated and then pinch the yarn around the eye of my needle and then wiggle the eye of my needle through that pinch. See that? See now everything's thread on there. So now I have this very super pointy needle that I then can come over here. Now this one, I don't need to do any duplicate stitch here. So for this one, I can literally just start piercing through the fiber and get it down where it looks like there aren't a whole lot of other ends woven in, so I'm not like making an area super thick. And I'm just going to go through some of the fibers here. Can you see my, my needle is through some of the fibers there? Hopefully my camera is staying in focus for me. I'm gonna pull that down. I might go a little bit further. I'm gonna go a little bit further on this one just so that way it's really in place and secure. Okay. And then on my way back, I'm not only gonna go through the fibers that I went through, but I'm gonna go through my actual fibers of the tail that I just pulled through. Can you see that? Can you see how I'm through the fibers of the tail? And then as I pull this back, that all really locks into place. It's very similar to like a Russian join. And then I can trim that and that is all secure. So as I weave my tails in each step of the way, it's not a daunting process for me to complete by the time I'm at my very end. So as you complete each of the charts and each of the increases, make sure you're weaving in those tails. The last thing I wanna mention is a lifeline. If you wanna make sure that you have points in your poncho that are absolutely perfect, that if something happened later on, you could rip back to and have like a safety net, you wanna make sure you add a lifeline. And the best place to add a lifeline in this project is in those increase rounds. So what I would do is I would finish the increase round and then I would take a tapestry needle and some cotton yarn and just thread it through all of those stitches on your needle and just let it sit there, okay? That's how you're gonna do a lifeline. If you want more instructions on how to do a lifeline, I have really detailed instructions for that. I have a great video. I'll put a link in the video description box below so that way you can get to that as well. And that's it, everybody. You are now off to the races to finish these three charts. You wanna finish all three charts and all of the increases so that way you're ready for chart number four in the next video. Don't forget to take pictures of each step along the way and share with me on social media. Use hashtag MarleyBird and tag me on Instagram. I'm the MarleyBird and I'll be sure to smash your like button. That's it for me, everybody. I'll see you in the next video, and I cannot wait to see your ponchos. Bye. Show me up. Show me love.